Hi, everybody. My name is Isaac. I'm Chief Innovation Officer at 2020 Research. Uh, we're a company that provides online qualitative uh, software and services to market researchers all around the world. Every year, we help a few hundred researchers do a few thousand online qualitative projects, uh, like the one we're going to talk about today with MC. And I have to warn you, I really love online qualitative, so sometimes I get really excited. MC was really bright, and he limited the number of slides I get, so hopefully <laughs> I won't have to take up too much time, and we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. In this case that MC is going to share with you, uh, we use what we call a multimodal platform, uh, which is our call board system, which the easy way to think about it is, at, at its core, it's a moderated online discussion, three-day, five-day, ten-day discussion with a group of participants. But we can engage them in all kinds of different activities. We can take them through markups. We can take them through webcam interactions. Or uh, more important for this case, different way, ways to interact with them mobily. And I make this point because it's an important one. It's one that we look over a lot in qualitative research. A lot of times, qualitative researchers pick up a tool, and they say, this is what I want to use, and this is what it's, I'm going to get out of it. What we find is more successful is to actually look at these different types of activities, like lenses. And I'm a very, very amateur photographer. And I'm here to tell you there is not a single lens in the world that does it all. Different lenses do different things. And it's the same thing with qualitative research. You need to pick up different lenses to take different pictures. And the pictures that you get by using these different things, if you combine them together, give you a better insight in what your consumer is actually doing. Uh, everybody in this room, I'm sure, fully understands the value that mobile can bring to qualitative research. No surprise to anybody. That's why you're sitting in these chairs. What, unfortunately, we don't talk about enough, I think, in this industry is mobile is not the solution to every research problem. A lot of people think it is. I've heard a lot of people say it is. On the qualitative side, it is not. It is a great, wonderful tool that can take our research places it could never go before. But it is just another lens. Now, what MC is going to tell you about is how he combined this really powerful lens that gives us, in the moment, individual insights. And he added that into an online discussion so that we got reported behavior and actual behavior and an opportunity to discuss those things in between. MC? Right. Hi everyone, uh, my name is MC. I lead the call team for Ipsos in Malaysia. So um, I think Ipsos has been working with 2020 for a long time. We've partnered together for many of our clients. So when this opportunity came out for this conference in KL, um, we were glad to be able to do this. In fact, for this particular case that we're gonna share with you, we actually did an actual real life study um, just, just to show you in terms of how it worked in specifically in Malaysia. So while we were sort of, um, I guess, brainstorming in terms of what should we um, do, what kind of topic, what kind of um, product should we basically base on, I think the first one that you saw earlier was on coffee. Um, we thought about that, but um, we also thought about what else can we do that usually will be quite different between claim consumption versus actual behavior. So what we then specifically came out was um, talking about alcohol, everyone's favorite subject, right? So, um, and a lot of times, I'm sure all of us think that we only had two drinks when we went out, but if you really count it, it would have been at least a dozen. So that, that was what, what got us started to, to look at alcohol as well in terms of a, a, a subject. And plus, um, I do work with a lot of these, um, I guess, the beer boys and so on. So that helps as well in terms of um, showcasing this kind of technology. Yeah. So we selected alcohol. Um, we wanted to understand in terms of how, um, in terms of behavior, in terms of actual consumption, would be different um, if we just use traditional um, focus group where we ask people to recall, which is what we have done quite a bit in the past, and versus using this mobile combining with online discussion. Right? So we're going to share with you later on in terms of um, what we found out from this actual study as well. Okay? Um, being a qualitative study, so we did it in a kind of small group. We had about 14 consumers um, within this age of 2029, which is perfect because these are the people who constantly looking at their phones every three seconds. And they are all basically smartphone users anyway. So it doesn't um, need them to learn anything new. It doesn't require to them to basically do anything that they don't already do. Yeah. Um, we basically told them, we give you a week during this week whenever you go out drinking. Tell us uh, where you are, who you're with, what you're drinking. Tell us what you're drinking specifically and why. So it, it, it's, again, um, very interactive. It's something that's fun for them to do. And like I said, they are already doing this a lot of times through Facebook, through Instagram, so on and so forth. So not an added effort for them to do things like that. Right? So in terms of the approach itself, um, let me pass you back to Isaac, who will tell you specifically what we did. Thank you. 
So, like I said, we employed a couple of different lenses or ways to view our participants. Uh, the first thing we did was kind of a, think of it like a standard online discussion. It's standard for me, somebody in the audience may not know how these work, but it's like an online moderated discussion that MC can lead where we can ask a series of questions, get feedback about general drinking behaviors, um, uh, brands and preferences about product, uh, and it allows MC the ability to get to really what is their reported behavior. He asks how many times they drink, what beverages they drink. This is where he collected a lot of that data. The other lens we used was, uh, and by the way, the, the last part you could do on a smartphone or a desktop or laptop, uh, we were agnostic. Uh, sometimes we choose and we say we just want them to do one piece on the desktop or laptop and vice versa. Uh, the, the journals we did completely through the mobile devices. That's right, nobody, okay. Um, where we asked them a series of about six different types of questions whenever they consumed alcohol. Where are you? What promotions do you see? What choice did, did you make? And we encouraged them to upload pictures and video about those experiences as they did it. So this is not reported behavior, this is their observed behavior. This is actually what they're actually out there doing. Now when we get the data back, uh, we, we call these life notes. And the researcher can look at uh, the date and time this occurred, uh, we get full geolocation, uh, if participants allow, 96% do. Uh, so we can see actually on a map where they were, we can see this is a promotional placard that tells the prices of the beers they were drinking, and they tell us all about what they were doing on a trip to Singapore. Now, this in and of itself, and being able to deliver this kind of data to clients and to researchers, I think it's fantastic, because it sets so much more context for this person's experience. I can see when, pretty early in the morning, I can see what they were doing, and I can see even the restaurant they were at. And that's data we really couldn't capture before. But I heard something really interesting on this panel uh, yesterday where the clients were talking a little bit about the authenticity or reliability of some of the data coming back, especially from quantitative participants. You know what, in qualitative research, we kind of look at it as a real advantage. We do a lot of studies where we screen people in and we want to know the right kind of people who buy the right kind of toothpaste in the right size tube and the right flavor. I have no idea what flavor toothpaste I buy, but by some chance I may get recruited into the wrong study because I said wintergreen, and that turned out to be the real uh, study they were looking to do. That happens because consumers aren't really good at knowing things like tiny th details about brands and products. We oftentimes set up studies where the very first thing we bring people into is we say, okay, we want you to go around your home, and we want you to take pictures of your kitchen, your bathroom, and we want to see what's really going on. Now, we didn't tell them that ahead of time, and they don't really know what we're looking for, but we're looking for the actual brands and products that we're using. And every now and then, we find somebody who reported the wrong brand or who lives in a home or is from a demographic we weren't really looking for, and we can exclude, exclude them from the study. So it actually helps us make sure we're getting the right people because we get to see inside their homes. We can see where they live on a map. So it's a lot more context than we normally get in the recruiting process. And finally, because we had this other lens where we can bring them into an interactive discussion, we actually get to some data we normally wouldn't get to. So this is a participant who, who uh, answered MC's question and then was uh, doing this from the mobile device. Mobile posts, uh, in our system at least, are typically 60 to 80% as long. Uh, the diction is a little bit less, use shorter words, autocorrect is used a lot. Um, and so you don't get quite the detail we would in an online discussion. But that really doesn't matter if you pick up another lens and you say, okay, well, I want to I probe on this. I need to know a little bit more. Can you please give me that? So we got the time of consumption information and we also got the ability to probe. Let's see. Cool. So what did we learn or what did we see from this entire exercise? By the way, it was quite interesting to look at the kind of feedback or the kind of pictures or videos that people take as the night goes on. So you start with very proper, I'm having a beer, to about one o'clock, I'm dancing, to about three o'clock, you can see lots of stuff, which I can't show you, unfortunately. So basically, in, in terms of all this information that came back to us, what we wanted to do is look at um, what are the various key drivers, what are the various key needs in terms of um, drinking, um, and what, what, what can we do about it. So the way that we have done is to look at um, the data itself, look at the, the um, feedback that we've gotten from all these uh, consumers. Um, in this framework. Uh, on the vertical axis, you will look at in terms of when they're out drinking, is it really about giving them a sense of freedom, letting loose? This is where, you know, I want to go out, I want to party, I don't care about tomorrow. That kind of social setting, that kind of uh, environment versus control. This is when, yes, I want to go out and drink, but I need to be myself. I need to take care of, uh, be aware of where I am, be aware of the people that I'm with and so on. So it's much more control in the sense. On the horizontal, you will look at a lot of times when we go out drinking, it's group. It's about you know, being with friends, it's about um, being with others, it's, it's a sense of belonging. But a lot of times, which people don't necessarily think a lot is 
they also drink quite a bit at home. Um, in fact, through this exercise, we have got respondents who say that actually I didn't know that I actually you know, um, sort of spend a lot of time drinking at home or when I'm watching TV or, and so on and so forth. So it, it was an interesting exercise as well for these people because um, they came back and they looked at all these sort of pictures and they realized, oh, I didn't know that, you know, that that was the kind of behavior that I had. So having said that, this is the kind of framework that we have used. And basically, we have sort of identified five different kind of um, drinking moments or drinking occasions um, that would be relevant for Malaysian. This is, by the way, for Malaysian drinkers. So it might be different for a different country. So I'll go into detail a little bit in terms of each of them. But basically, uh, there are five of these uh, different kind of, um, I guess, drinking occasion, drinking needs yeah, that we have identified. The first one is really about de-stressing, which I guess everybody can relate to it quite well. It's at the end of the hard day's work, I just want to you know, basically have a drink to release myself. Um, it's about basically uplifting your mood. You know? I want to just uh, end my day well, get some kind of self-reflection, so on and so forth. So this, this kind of um, occasion is really about happy hour. This is about going to a pub. Um, in terms of what it means for the brand is at the end of the day, you need to connect them. Um, it's not about you know, shouting out, hey, well, the, the, the brand that allows you to party and all that. That's not the kind of need. So for example, in this case, brands like Heineken, brands like Guinness uh, works very well because it's about savoring the moment. It's about enjoying the kind of, um, you know, sort of um, distressing moment. All right. Um, contrary to the, the one that you saw earlier, this is really about letting loose. This is about going out. This is about, you know, celebration. So this is where... Um, a lot of consumer, you know, say, what the heck, I'm getting pissed tonight. This is, you know, my chance to get drunk. So in that sense, uh, what it means for the brand is a lot of times it's about fun. It's about, you know, getting uh, whatever that I can get. And the kind of alcohol that they drink also change a lot. Because in the traditional kind of, um, I guess, discussion or, or focus group that we do when we ask people, hey, when you go out party, what do you drink? Oh, I drink beer. And that's it. Yeah. But in this kind of scenario, you, you will see a lot coming out which they might not have recalled. For example, this, this particular person showed us that, you know, there's this thing about wasabi shot, which is quite interesting. So feel free to try it when you have time. So things like that really um, is, is something that um, I guess quite powerful that we are able to identify through this sort of mobile platform, which we might not get from a, a traditional or conventional face-to-face -face or even telephone interviews in that sense. Um, the other needs is really about socializing. This is slightly different from celebration in the sense of it's about connection with friends. It's about um, the kind of relationship. It's a kind of bonding. Yeah? So in that sense, um, what they are looking for will be drinks and places that is a little bit more quiet, more down to earth. Um, again, what they are drinking is quite interesting because at this point in time, it's about happy hour. It's about flipping through menu. So even from this study, we got people who, who took photos of, oh, I like this promotion or I like this particular kind of um, cocktail because it's quite interesting. So it allows them to basically capture down all this at a very spontaneous kind of instant. Um, there are also occasions where a drink is just a drink. It's very functional in the sense that it just because I'm having a meal, I just want to have the drink to go with it. So in this case, therefore, for brands, implication is about food pairing. So what, what are the kind of things that would go well with different kind of food? So again, we would have quite interesting kind of pictures that people have uh, snapped. Um, you know, when I'm eating steak, I drink wine. When I'm eating steamboat, I drink beer, so on and so forth. So you'll be surprised that even nasi lemak goes well with certain kind of alcohol in Malaysia. So again, uh, bringing out different contexts in terms of what are the brands that would work well um, for different kind of drinking occasion. Um, this one is really about, I guess, in a way, um, self-indulgent to almost, in the sense of I just want to wind down, I want to relax. Uh, this, for me, then, therefore, is a really about a sense of satisfaction. It's about treating myself, yeah, giving myself uh, some kind of drink that, you know, feel that I deserve it. So slightly different from the distressing. Uh, this one is really more about deciding what they want and really buying, um, you know, based on their personal preference. Um, originally, I had this video to show you, but I think it's a bit too risky because it goes a bit too well. So I'll just skip that for now. Um, you you want to see it, you can uh, come to me later. So what do we learn from all this entire exercise besides the learning that I've shared with you? Um, 
Now, with, with Qual Mobile, um, basically allows us to validate what the respondents say before um, they go out drinking versus what actually happened. Because a lot of times, they might tell us, I'm going out tonight, um, uh, just going to be a quiet night, just with friends. But then again, when you see what they post, what they come back with, it's totally different. Yeah, so it allows you to basically, um, based on that, understand what drives it, what are the critical moments that might have changed that kind of behavior. Yeah. And the spontaneous moments are very much captured through live note journals. Uh, video is great, pictures is great, even just words is great, because it allows us to basically then combine those two and basically explore with the consumer. Yeah? So at the end of the day, we could basically identify what they thought happened versus what actually took place at the end of the day. All right? And I guess the last point is, through this exercise, it makes consumer research more fun as well. Because all this while, consumer has been, I guess, a little bit tired and um, feel that it's the same old thing. I come to your office, I sit down two hours and I start chatting. So with this, it allows them to, like I said, it, it's not something that they are not already doing. So it's sort of built on onto what they are already doing and it's fun for them. So it helps in that sense for us to recruit the kind of right profile of people we want as well. All right. And I think that's it. Any questions? Thank you very much. Yes, we've got. Thank you for your presentation. It's an ex certainly an ex very exciting uh, technique. Uh, two questions. One is uh, the moderators that's involved in this project, uh, how different will be the skill sets from a traditional focus group moderator? Mm. Right? Uh, second question is in Malaysia, we know that uh, you usually pay, respond pay respondents. Uh, is the fee different from this one? Okay. Is it more, lower? Or um, in terms of the moderator skill, it's not that different because it's, it's the, the platform of the technique allows you to collect the data, but in terms of how you analyze it, it's still going to be similar, except now you have more things to play with, if I can put it in that context. Because it's not just about what they say, it's about what they have done, what are the kind of um, facts that's out there. So in a sense, you need to be, um, I guess, um, creative in terms of asking questions. Like, First, listening to what the consumer might have to say in terms of their attitude behavior. And then, if it's quite different, of course, the trick is, oh, that was interesting what you said, but uh, can you tell me a bit more what happened here? So I wouldn't say that it's that different as a probing skill, but it's just that. You know, it allows you to have more um, data or more tools to play with to, to understand the consumer behavior. All right. uh, the second question in terms of, of course, the good old thing about incentive. Um, I wouldn't say it's more expensive uh, because it's, one, something that they're already doing. Second, it's fun. So um, they don't mind doing this exercise because it's something that they already are doing it when they're out with friends, drinking, and so on. It's just that they have to remember doing it. So what we always do is, um, you know, before they go out, they would need to let us know that I'm going out today. So what we would do is send them a, a reminder SMS to say, hey, remember you're going out tonight, please make sure you do this task or homework. And that was it. Um, it. It doesn't require a lot more in terms of uh, incentive, which means for the client, good news is it doesn't cost that much more. Hi, uh, Michael from uh, Acorn. Uh, did you feel, I mean, uh, did the behavior of the respondents in any way change um, as a result of them being on such an activity? I mean, yeah. Yeah, did you, did you find that any of them, um, or did you suspect that any of them changed their behavior as a result of being a participant in such an activity which was exciting to them? Okay, uh, the answer is no, because simply it's something that they already are doing it. If it's something new totally, in terms of using mobile phone to take photo or you know, going out with friends to take photo, it might change their, their behavior in a sense, hey, let's go out tonight, I have this mobile phone that's new, I can go out and change and do. But it is something that is already part of their life. So that works quite well. So in that sense, the data kind of reflect that as well. Uh, yeah, and I'll add, um, in, the, in studies, whether it's mobile or online or a bunch of different methodologies, we find that there's a little bit of period of, um, as we'd say in the US, breaking the ice or getting them comfortable with the methodology. I always tell people to throw away the first day or the first activity because they will be um, trying to figure it out. But after that, they get more and more and more natural. 
uh, and you, you don't have to worry about that quite as much. But on the very first day of a research project or the first activity they do, I was still researchers. Just consider that to be kind of, you know, they may be staging that a little bit, they may be thinking about it. Um, they will get unbelievably real and authentic on the third and fourth and fifth day of your study, more real than you probably want them to be. Uh, Julius? <laughs> uh, Julius from uh, Acon. Hi. Uh, just out of curiosity, what happened after the second ring? After the second ring? Were they still sending you photographs yeah. and this thing? Yeah. And you were still sending them SMSs? Uh, no. The thing is, the moderator doesn't have to be on standby at 2 a.m. to answer their question. So this information is sent by them. Uh -huh. The probing gets to happen on the second day. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm just curious because after the second ring, do they really care uh, to send you photos and all? Oh, because they, they still do. Yeah. I mean, yeah. again, it's I guess part of the briefing to the respondent is their responsibility or commitment to the project. Uh, okay. That's their task. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Very good. Okay. Any more questions from the floor at all? Okay, well, my burning question is where can I get a wasabi shot? Because uh, is that a local speciality? Kind of bar downstairs, probably. Be <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so thank you very much to Isaac and MC. Thank you.